Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the people. But the Lord will arise upon you and His glory will be seen upon you. And the promise of the Lord came to Isaiah when He said, The nations will come to your light and the kings to the brightness of your rising. There is no one higher than our mighty God. Heavenly Father, we declare that. We declare that over this season. We declare that over this church. We declare that over this city. We declare that over this state. We declare that over this nation, that there is no one higher than You, Lord God. That in our halls of parliament, Your name will be proclaimed. In our business offices, Your name will be proclaimed. In our schools and universities, Your name will be proclaimed. Heavenly Father, we declare this. We declare this, that there is one, no one higher than You, our God. And they all said, Amen. Amen. Fantastic. You can take a seat. Thank you, team. Well, as, uh, as Bernie said, it is, uh, it is great to be in the house on the first Sunday of 2019. If you are a guest here today, or maybe you've kind of ignored me or I've ignored you or something like that, uh, my name is Sean, along with my wife, Morella. We have the absolute privilege to pastor this church. And I say that pretty much every week because it is a privilege. It is an honour. Uh, it is a calling. It is hard work, but I wouldn't do anything different, would not do anything different. And uh, because I truly believe that we are in good hands in this city. There's some great churches. God is alive. Things are happening. We're believing. We are seeing marriages restored. Got to be silence there. I believe in that. We are seeing marriages restored. We are seeing relationships that were broken repaired. We are seeing hurts that have been hanging on people and offences that have been hanging on people, maybe rightly so, for not just years but decades. We are seeing God just put it in its right place. Because we are stepping into a season as an army marching forward for his kingdom. And as we do this together, we get the opportunity to serve as leaders. It's just a title. But as we get to do this together, as the multiplication effect comes, we are believing in our heart that this year we will see 365 people come to know Jesus Christ for the first time. And you may be sitting there and going, that's crazy. How many did you have last year, Pastor Sean? Well, we saw 80-odd people, 80 salvations. But I believe in a God where there is no limits. I believe in a God where there is anything is possible. And we have an incredible team Just have a look at this place on the first week of January. It's full. You could be out playing cricket or doing a barbecue or whatever, but there's a hunger coming back for the Word of God. There is a hunger coming back to be in the house and fellowshipping with people. We are in the most disconnected time of our lives. In the UK Parliament, they've just put in a minister of loneliness. It's true. Because there is, an, uh, there is an epidemic of social brokenness that is happening. One in four people go home to nobody every night. One in four. We are in the most disconnected time, I believe, that ever has been. I can only speak for my 45 years, but I asked my father. 
But there is a hunger returning to people to want to be connected, to fellowship with each other, to be in relationship. And, and the questions I get from people and, the, and the, the comments I get from people, the first one I get as a pastor is, is what is my calling on my life? And we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. But the second one is, is people are just hungry for a hope. There is a thousand things out there that you could look up today. You can go to Google and check and, and just Google hope. And they'll tell you, oh, you can pay $5 for this or $10 for this or do this. There is only one God, only ever has been and there only ever will be. And there is a hunger returning. And so why did we step into the ministry to do this? Because it's beautiful. It's ugly. It's hard. And it's, it's just outstanding at the same time. This is an amazing, amazing church. We are incredibly privileged. We are incredibly honoured to lead, to walk the journey with people because I am believing for this city that when they do a census in what is it, another three years' time or something like that, that there will be this abnormality that will come up in the city of Hobart. There'll be an abnormality. Oh man, I haven't even gone close to starting, hey? There will be an abnormality that will come up in the city of Hobart, and there, there will be all these boffins in the in the data labs, you know, crunching their numbers, going, well, it's supposed to be that two percent of people go to churches, and you know, we're supposed to be seeing the fact that 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 atheism is on the rise and all of these things. And they're gonna look and they're gonna go, what is happening there? I'm gonna tell you it's a community of people that are reaching out, connecting with people, walking the journey and pointing them towards Jesus Christ. That's what it's gonna be. Our offices are full during the week. We don't pay them all. I wish we could. But they're full during the week of people who are hungry getting on the phones saying, hey, haven't seen you for a couple of weeks. How are you? They're the most important people in our church, not what I do. Because they're wanting to connect and grow with people and say, hey, how have you been? How has your week been? We're in an awesome tribe. We've got a, a couple, no, maybe there's three of them here, from C3 Taupool over in New Zealand. Our friends are Mark and... Mark and Sarah Percy, we actually did a masterclass with them just about three, uh, three months ago. Great to have you guys here. All right, I'll get into my message, I promise. I can only speak from a young lad's perspective because I was a young lad. There is still such a thing as male and female people. I'm a young lad. I grew up a young lad. And for me growing up, it was all about BMX bikes yeah. with spoky dokies, <laughs> playing, playing cards on pegs in your bikes. Yeah, anyway, my brother had a dragster. Anyone have a dragster? And superheroes. Now, whether we like to admit it or not, I believe we all have a superhero Superman, Batman. Captain America, Thor, the Hulk, Catwoman, Wonder Woman, the Green Lantern. I kind of have two. Wolverine, he's a bit of a late addition, Wolverine, because he, he represents to me never giving up. And um, he represents never giving up and also, also that he was kind of that cool bad. You know that cool bad? I kind of want to be cool bad. <laughs> but for me, my favourite was Spider-Man. But not so much Spider-Man as the superhero, but Peter Parker. Peter Parker was average. Peter Parker was actually even a little bit dorky. Peter Parker was not muscle-bound. Peter Parker was not the coolest dresser. Thank you. Peter Parker was the kind of guy I reckon I would have hung around with in school. And beaten up. <laughs> Stan Lee, who, who, who created uh, Spider-Man, died just a month or so ago, once said that Peter Parker was written to be relatable to the average young readers of comics. 
in that he dealt with rejection, bouts of loneliness and feelings of inadequacy. And unlike others, like Captain America or Batman, Peter Parker had no mentor to guide him. The point about Spider-Man is that if you had just read about him climbing up a burning wall to save a damsel in distress, you run the risk of missing who Peter Parker was. Stan Lee also said this, with great power or position also comes responsibility. And with great responsibility comes a willingness to do the average well. My message title this morning is Do Average Well. And we are in a series that we're starting today called Epic Tales. And in this series, we're going to look at Bible studies and we're going to look at Bible characters, but not so much focusing on the outcome of what happened, because to be honest, we can go to the end of the book and we can find out what happens. I've said before, I'm not so much of a reader, but my wife is an incredible reader. And I've often said to her, just turn to the last page. Seriously. Why do people waste 600 pages of a book? Just go to the last page. You'll find out what to do. Man, now I've set it up, haven't I? (laughs) Loving that. Come on. Woo! We've got the readers and we've got those who spoil it. The point is, if we go to the end of the story, if we just look at Super, uh, at Spider-Man as the hero who saved everybody, we miss who Peter Parker was. And we miss how he prepared and responded to the callings that were far greater than I think he ever imagined. Has anyone ever read the story of Ruth in the Bible? It is outstanding. She's a superhero. She is a superhero, yet she was just a Moabite widow. If we read the start, she was just an average, actually she was probably deemed as below average, Moabite widow. She was actually destitute and doing it tough. But by simply doing the average things well and what was put before her, she is a superhero that is written in the Word of God. There is a book written after that woman. The challenge we have with Bible characters and the challenge we have leading into a series of going, well, we're going to do all of these epic tales, is that we have a tendency to see the story as as fictional comic book heroes. And in fact, we can view the whole Bible as a great story that sits on the shelf. Author Brian Chappell says this, Too many today view the Bible as a disconnected series of moral tales with unbelievable characters interspersed between impossible commandments woven into a maze of mysteries that somehow produced a message about a nice Jesus found in the New Testament to counter a mean God found in the Old Testament. That's what we're up against. So my prayer as we step into this series of epic tales is go away and and read them. Read what the average Moabite destitute woman Ruth did so that we can honour her as a superhero. Get into the Word of God and don't skip to the last page. Understand what it meant for, for these people to get where they are because they did the average well. The tale I want to focus on today is uh, based on one of the most monumental figures of biblical history, David, son of Jesse, who went from the sheep fields of Bethlehem to being affectionately known as a king after God's own heart. Imagine that one on your resume. King after God's own heart. So many great moments uh, in, in his life, but I want to focus on the battle with, his, uh, with the giant called Goliath, found in 1 Samuel 17, if you've got your Bibles. I'm actually going to be using a paraphrased version from a book called Goliath Must Fall by Louis Giglio. I don't normally do book promotions up here. This is an outstanding book. If you have a giant in front of your life of any sort, I want to encourage you, read this book. You can find it in our bookstore out there. Read this book, Goliath Must Fall. Okay, I'm going to read from this. 
A chilly morning wind sliced through the tense valley. The clanking of cooking pots heard throughout the war camp suddenly stopped. Every head in the Israelite camp turned, every eye fixed on the incredulous sight that approached the valley floor. One young man walked towards the giant. On the other side of the valley, Goliath couldn't believe it either. Squinting, he shaded his brow and stared towards the lonely figure that dared challenge him. Who does this guy think he is? He is very average, Goliath muttered. Someone actually wants to fight me? He motioned to his armour bearer, gripped a javelin and started to march forward. The giant was eager, unafraid. For 40 days, Goliath's victorious, vicious taunts had echoed throughout the valley. Everyone in the Israelite camp had heard the taunts every day. You cowards, he shouted. Someone, just someone, stand up and fight me or are you all too afraid? You're worthless. How many, how many people have heard that in their life? You're worthless. You're average. How many people have heard that in their life? The whole lot of you, every one of you standing on the other side of the valley, you're powerless, you're weak, just like your God. I defy you and I defy your God. Can I tell you, when people defy you, they defy your God. When you stand up and represent who Christ is in you and people defy you, they're defying your God. That's on them. The taunts had stopped every one of the Israelites in their tracks. For 40 straight days, they had been frozen in fear. The Israelites hated the giant, but they couldn't seem to stop the taunts of his voice in their head. At nine feet tall and undefeated, Goliath was known throughout the land as a savage killer. Soldiers had seen him rip his enemies, mauling them, leaving them bloody, desperate, destroyed and dead. He was impenetrable, undefeatable. No one, no one had stood up and answered the call to fight him. And no one knew it better than the giant himself. But now, one small frame dare approach. He's not even wearing armour, one of the Israelite fighters said. We've never seen this before. Get him out of there before he gets hurt. But no one ran to the boy's aid. Goliath spat on the ground in disgust, shrugging back his shoulders as if to awaken to the battle. He adjusted his heavy armour. He could see his opponent was only a boy, an average boy at that. The giant continued to march. He drew his arm back and it grew taut as he aimed his javelin. Goliath's accuracy was deadly. He was known across the nation. All it would take with one throw, the boy would lie breathless. The armies on both hills erupted in shouts at the impending fight. The Israelites yelled for the kid, come back, don't do it, you're average. The Philistines roared, kill him, rip his head off. Goliath himself wanted to get a few jeers in. And he jested, am I a dog that you would come at me with a stick? Come here and I'll feed your bones to the beasts of the earth. Unfazed, David focused on the task ahead. There's four things. In order to do the average well, there's four points I want to give this morning. The first one is that we need to do the simple things well. We need to do the simple things well. Before we get to the story of David and Goliath, we hear this in Samuel chapter 16, going back a, a, a chapter. It says this, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse from Bethlehem, for I have provided for myself a king amongst his son. Down to verse 4. It says, Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peacefully? And he said, peacefully I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourself and come with me to the sacrifice. He did so and Jesse invited them. When they came, he looked on Eli, the, the eldest son, and thought, surely the Lord's anointed one is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his outward appearance or on the height of his statue because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees and the outward appearance, but the Lord sees on the heart. The Lord then went through with the seven sons. 
And he said to him, got to the last one and said, oh, are all of your sons here? And he said, uh, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. He wasn't even invited to the party. In this story, we're introduced to Jesse and his eight sons who lived in Bethlehem, which was a small place. Samuel was a respected prophet. He was a judge. He was high up there. When someone like that comes into a small town like Bethlehem, there's a bit of commotion going on. People know that someone important has come into the town. Verse 5 is really important in this. Verse 5 talked about the fact that Samuel said to Jesse, go and purify yourself, come with me to the sacrifice. This actually meant bathing. This actually meant purifying your house. In those times, it actually meant a period of time. So although Samuel came to them, it probably wasn't until the next day that they lined up all in a row to be counted before Samuel. What I'm saying is there is plenty of time to have gone and got David from out in the sheep fields. We often read this and we think to ourselves, well, Samuel walked in and he's just going to look at whoever was in the house. He actually states there. See, there is not a word in the Bible that is not put there because God wants it to be there. And he said, consecrate yourself, purify yourself. It would have taken about 24 hours to do those things. So they had time to go and get Jesse, but they didn't go, sorry, to go and get David, but they didn't do so. Because we read that the youngster, David, is out in the paddock looking after the sheeps and sheep, sheeps. Out the sheeps. Why don't we have sheeps? <laughs> David was out looking after the sheeps and a goat. It was a very average job. Too often we are drawn to the special. And we neglect what is before us. We strive for the important and forget about the average. We are too busy wanting to bust into our superhero outfits and forget about the fact that once Spider-Man was Peter Parker. As we grow as a church, opportunities will arise in so many different areas. But it is essential that we do the simple things well. It is essential that we stop and chat and ask how someone is going. That we build relationship and have a coffee. We can do all all the fancy stuff, but we need to do the simple things well. Second point is this. Prepare in plain clothes. Prepare in plain clothes. In Mark chapter 12, verse 38 to 40, we read where Jesus goes into, he's in with the temple and he absolutely gives it to the religious leaders. And when he tells them, stop parading around in your flowing robes, stop looking for the compliments for people. Too many people are walking around saying, hey, did you hear how good I preached there? Oh, this is starting to cut, isn't it? We've got to get away from this. Jesus said really clearly, stop looking for the compliments, stop parading around, stop looking for the the best seats in the house. Yes, I sit in the front row because operationally and practically it works because it's going to look really silly if I'm coming from the back there. But the reality is, is that there is people in every seat in the red chairs here who are doing things and are just as important in what we're doing. In the three minutes there, it may be the conversation that you have with the person next to you who is struggling and facing a giant, and that is the best preach that will be told all day, is in the three minutes when you connect with them. My first training officer in ambulance would always say to me, prepare in plain clothes. In other words, he would say, study the protocols Know your drugs, prepare your kit, get into the training lab and practice your skills. Find a mannequin and intubate 10, 20, 100, 500 times in plain clothes so that when you go out there and you've got your uniform on and you're called upon to do your job, you've prepared well. There's some great preparation that we can do and it's called studying the Word of God. It's called getting on our knees and praying. It's called 
It's called uh, mentoring with others. Get around. Find your connection. Ask some of the questions. Do you know what? Whether you're 60 or whether you're 16 in here, we can all do with a bit of mentoring from somebody else. Before David slayed a giant named Goliath, I can imagine he spent hundreds of hours with a slingshot. Thank you, Will. With a slingshot. Can you imagine him out in the paddocks? Safety Steve wouldn't let me actually fly a, a rock in here. He put, he put a, I said to him, can I set up something? And he said, no. So you just got to pretend I've got five pebbles here. How much fun would that have been? For me. Can you imagine? David was out there in a job that wasn't very prestigious, but he did it well. He would have spent hours making sure he knew his slingshot perfectly. I reckon he would have gone through the field and he knew what every rock was like. He would have known. You have a think about this. When he faced Goliath, I don't know whether he was 10 foot away, 20 foot away or 100 foot away. The reality is he needed to know how the rock would fly, the trajectory, the wind. He needed to know everything. And the reason he knew it is because when he was just doing the average, he did it well. When David went to, later on, when he went to play in the, in the courts of Saul, his harp, he didn't just walk in there and all of a sudden say, God, I've never seen this instrument. Let me play it perfectly for the king. I reckon he was in his room practicing. I reckon his, his fingers were bleeding. When he was writing songs, he didn't just write the, the, the best song first up. He wasn't some one-hit wonder. He would have been writing down all the time words of affirmation to God. He would have been writing words of praise to God. He would have been songwriting all the time. In, the, in, the, in his bedroom where he was just average David, he did things well. Third one is this. He remained true to himself. There is two pieces of scripture in this epic tale that I think demonstrate the type of character that David was. The first was found in verse 28, when David's oldest brother, Eli, uh, verbally degrades and humiliates him. He says, what are you doing here anyway? You don't belong on the battlefield. And then to rub it in, the older brother, I thank God for my older brother because he looked after me at school because I was a little turd. My older brother was always there looking after me. But Eli, the older brother, actually shamed him. And he said to him, aren't you supposed to be looking after those few sheep? He didn't even say, aren't you supposed to be looking after the thousands and thousands of sheep? He said, aren't you supposed to be looking after those few sheep? In a church world, we can do this. We can go, well, you've only got a church of 25 people. I'm kind of more important than you. God bless that person who is doing that. Because those sheep matter. Every single person who walks in the door matters to the kingdom of God. Second point is this, is that, is that when Saul, King Saul meets with David, he says to him, Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a, cate, and a coat of, of armor. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn things before. I don't know about you, but when you step into someone else's calling, it doesn't feel right. Each and every person in here has a purpose and a plan. How do I know that? Because the Word of God tells me that. I cannot step into somebody else's. I've got some news for you. I am no Stephen Furtick. I'm no teacher like Ravi Zachariah. I cannot be Phil Pringle, Bill Johnson, or any one of the hundreds of mighty day men and women of God. Only they can be who they are called to be. Exactly who God has called them to be. I can learn from them. I can study from them. I can feed off them. I can strive to, to adopt qualities that they have in place in their ministries. I can look for techniques that they utilize. 
but I can only be what God has called me to be. And when I read that, I see David saying, Saul, thank you. I might be protected in your armor, but I've got to step out into what God has called me to be. That in itself is the front-footed faith. To say, I will, when I could be protected, I will step out in the front-footed faith. Fourth one is this. Final point is this. Is that we need to promote God. Doing the average well. When you do the average well, we need to promote God. In and through all things, David gave God the glory. When Saul questioned David's ability, he didn't get defensive or self-promoting. He simply said, the Lord delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear. The Lord will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistines. When David was cursed and mocked and called a ruddy-faced boy, David's comeback was not self-effacing, but to declare that he would defeat in the name of my God, the only God, the God of heavens. He declared over the giant, the Lord will conquer you. Not me. Not me with my slingshot and five stones. Not me, the shepherd boy. Not me, the harp player. When I stand before the giant that is before me, the Lord will conquer it. There's a beautiful verse in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. And it says this, I'll paraphrase the first part. David, the shepherd boy, was out in the fields. King Samuel, uh, Samuel the prophet, said, go and get him. Jesse, go and get him. You can just imagine David walking in there. Dirty. Probably a bit tired. Anyone who's done night shift would know. Kind of sucks. He would have walked in there. He may not have even known what was going on. Seven boys would have been lined up, probably with their shoulders hunched down because they hadn't been picked. I can just see them in height. And then boy number four would have been tall because he ate all the steroid chicken. But every one of them, would have been hunched over. Disconsolate. David would have walked in going, what's going on here? There's Samuel the prophet, the judge. I'm just average David. I've just been out looking after my sheep and the goat. There's a beautiful verse that says, when, when he walked in, Samuel looked at him and said, that's the one. That's the one. And then it says this, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him from that day on. In the time of Pentecost, just before that, when Jesus ascended into heaven, he said, I will send one who is greater than what I am. I will send the Holy Spirit to come upon you. Do you know how we do average well? In the grace and love of the Holy Spirit. Our helper, our advocate, our friend. We don't have to do this journey alone. As we face 2019, many will face times and giants that are, are, are just bringing you down. And you're kind of the, the clock ticked over and it's like it's a new year. I, and then you look up and you go, man, that same giant is in front of me. I want to encourage you, church. 
that God sent His Son and He sent His Holy Spirit in order that we can do the average well. We don't have to do this journey alone. We don't have to do this journey alone. I shared an email with our leadership team this week which started with a quote that said, despite what was before him, David focused on what was ahead. Have a think about that. It's a play on words. Despite what was before him, David focused on what was ahead. And he could do this because he remained humble. And he could do this because the Spirit of the Lord had fallen afresh on him. I'm going to ask you just to close your eyes. I'm not going to delay this at all. But just where you are, I'm going to close your eyes. I've got my eyes open and our pastoral care team is here. But I'm just asking you just for respect and those around you just to close your eyes. I want to encourage you this morning that if you want to start and receive God into your life, or it may be that you've received God into your life, but you've never received the Holy Spirit and that you feel like doing average is so hard in your life and you want to do it well, I want to give you the opportunity in just one moment just to raise your hand. It may be that you've turned up this morning and you don't know why or you are struggling and you are facing those giants, can I tell you that when David, God chose David, the Spirit of the Lord came on him. God has chosen every single one of you to be His children. Just where you are, as each eye is closed, I'm going to ask you, if you'd like to respond this morning and say, God, I want you to be over me. I want to put you in your rightful place in my life. Or it may be, it's very simple, that, or it may be to say, I need a refreshing of the Holy Spirit on my life. I want you just to raise your hand where you are now. Just across. Thank you. I can see that hand. Is there any others? I can see that hand. Is there any others there? Thank you. I can see that one. Thank you. Just keep them up. Thank you. I can see that hand. Is there anyone else? Thank you. I can see that one. Thank you. I can see that hand there. Just keep them up. Just keep them up for a moment. I'm looking in just the pastoral care team. That's all it is. I want you to keep them up there because this is a moment in your life where God has spoken to you, where God has spoken directly to you. Don't worry about what your neighbour is doing. Don't worry about what the person in front or behind is doing. This is your miracle moment with God. This is your miracle moment with God. There is no condemnation and judgment. This is your miracle moment in God. This is a time when you need to be front-footed. You may not have. Just keep your hands up just for a minute. Thank you. Just keep them up. It may be that you, as you're stepping into this, you might feel like you're stepping into it with no armour on. God has got you. God has got you. God has called you and He's ordained you. I'm going to ask in just one moment. We're going to open our eyes. I'm going to hand back to Bernie. But I'm going to ask those who have raised their hands to just meet to my right-hand side. Just on the right-hand side, we've got a couple of lovely ladies over here from our pastoral care team. Just as Bernie comes up and speaks now, I'm going to ask you just to get out of your seats, have some absolute courage. Do you know what? This is your miracle moment. There is no condemnation and judgment. This is your miracle moment. I'm going to ask you, if you feel you'd like to, then just to meet on the right-hand side. We step with you. I'm going to come with you as well because we just love to pray with you and to be with you and to acknowledge this moment in what Christ has done with you. Why don't we just give those people an incredible round of applause of what God has done. Thanks, Bernie.